All right, so hello everyone. Uh, my name is Maddie. I am from Chiasma Dunedin and welcome to our web series. Today I have the privilege of speaking with John McEwen, who was a principal scientist at Ag Research. John, thank you so much for making the time to talk today. Uh, happy to be here. <laughs> so just to get us started, I was wondering if you could tell me a little bit more about your personal career path, what field you studied in, um, what made you choose this particular path, and has this taken you where you thought it would? Uh, yes. Um, well, um, there tends to be two types of people. There's what people call straight arrows, um, <laughs> and then people that sort of um, fall into the position that they finish up in and uh, on the second. Mm -hmm. um, I was born on a beef and sheep farm in Tokanui, which is on the edge of the Catlins down in Southland. Mm -hmm. And Dad had a small Romney stud, so I was brought up working on a farm, handling sheep and cattle, recording mm -hmm. at lambing. And I worked on farms right through Varsity, um, crutching, shearing, building fences, tractor work, you know, all that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, I look, really like maths and science. Uh, uh, my father had been a gold miner in the 30s and had cabinets full of rocks. And our farm had petrified wood and jasper and agates and we clicked with them and cut them up with diamond saws and all that sort of stuff. So That's I was going to be a geologist. Mm -hmm. uh, um, uh, so uh, my father died when I was about 16 and my mum farmed for the uh, balance of the property until she died probably uh, about 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so um, the trouble was I went to Targa University in 1974 and at that particular time, geologists weren't in demand. Mm -hmm. right? So I decided I'd do biochemistry instead. Um, and that was a really amazing time for biochemistry because people were just beginning to think about um, doing sequencing. They just sort of figured out how protein synthesis worked and stuff like that. And so I was, I was the first of my uh, family to go to university. And uh, um, because my mother and father are quite old, they'd actually never been past primary school. So it's quite, you know, so anyway, that was that. So I, when I graduated with my degree in 1978, most, uh, that's my um, uh, honours degree, most of my friends and classmates immediately left New Zealand. Mm. Uh, just gone, bang, gone like that. And I went back to Invercargill and worked for a while as a teacher, uh, even though I didn't have any training. And about six months after that, I was working temporary basis at Woodlands Research Station, which was a sheep research station. Yeah. And after about another six months, I was a research technician running sheep genetics trials, did some computer programming courses in my spare time. Mm -hmm. I was appointed as an animal scientist after about 18 months, and probably in part because I couldn't rec recruit anybody else to work at <laughs> the cargo. <laughs> we won't go there. <laughs> so um, my career started from there, and it took me about 10 to 20 years, but I finished up basically using all my chemistry, physiology, and biochemistry uh, after about 20 years. But in the meantime, I was doing a whole lot of other things. Yeah. And so I was really self-taught in quantitative genetics mm -hmm. and computer programming, right? And easy so I, things. Right? Just <laughs> yeah. easy things, yes. Yeah, and I've, so I found it pretty ironic teaching quantitative genetics at Otago and what's now Gen 1315. Uh, for about 10 years um, because the quantitative genetic stuff I really learned on the job. Um, so there was a sort of practical farming side that I knew, but all the agronomy, soil science and stuff like that I learned on the job from people I worked with. Uh, I went over to Ireland and I worked the uh, Learned about quantitative genetics analysis from uh, Seamus Hanrahan when I was transferring to Ireland. And I could go on, but I was really lucky with my bosses. Um, but pretty much the training I got basically consisted of reading and absorbing a whole lot of journals, right? That's what I did. Um, and so 
it was lucky that I got back into that later on. Um, <clears throat> um, I was pretty much on my own down there uh, for Woodlands for about six or seven years. Um, I'd probably get up to Invermay or Dunedin maybe once a fortnight or once a month. Um, and here comes a little piece that I've got to say. <laughs> Basically, they pulled me back to the mothership after six years. Um, scientists left on their own for longer than that tend to go past independence and be, go, become feral. Um, <laughs> <laughs> very resistant to instruction. So, <laughs> yeah. So um, I think they did the right thing in retrospect. Yeah. So, yes. So that's a bit of my background. It's, um, so I finished up doing, uh, you know, genetics and um, genomics, um, but it basically, it took me about 20 years from my training to when I finished up back doing roughly what I've been trained to do. Wow, that's an incredible journey. And it sounds like you've certainly become the whole, the whole package, really. Um, I think it's really cool as well to think that um, a lot of emphasis was probably placed on the fact that you knew how to do things, you could actually self-teach yourself. I mean, even being taught at university, I still struggle to pick something up. I don't know how, how I could have done that. Um, so I think that's that's really I, I had, that you I, I, I had really good people um, that I worked with. I you know, really very knowledgeable people that I worked with and mm. they helped a lot. And I guess ultimately it comes down to, you know, if you've got those practical skills, if you've got that hands on experience, um, being able to sort of recite a, a notebook or something like that is all good and well, but if you can actually take it that step further and teach yourself those skills. I think that's what a lot of students are sometimes a bit afraid to do is actually step out of your comfort zone, take on that extra course, take on that extra skill set. Yeah, uh, we'll probably probably get on to a bit about that later on. Um, <laughs> was that, um, yeah, so, um, so um, for me, probably, um, um, I think that, you know, um, People often ask me, you know, what do you look for when you get uh, students or you're employing people? Mm -hmm. And in the biological sciences in the area that we work in nowadays, um, you really need first year university mathematics and statistics. Mm -hmm. So this is in the research side I'm talking about. And you also need to know about computer programming and databases. You don't need to be a computer programmer, but you don't. You shouldn't be afraid of it. You get what I mean? Um, and you get very few people that come through with that training nowadays, right? Mm -hmm. So quite often what we do is we get people, we employ people, and we actually suggest that they go back to university <laughs> and do those <laughs> couple of extra units. <laughs> Imagine and everyone's we, thrilled. <laughs> uh, well, they realise why it's useful, yeah. right? Um, and as it, in, in many cases, it's so that, um, not so that you're doing it, but you can talk to and understand the people that are doing it. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, that leads pretty much straight into that question that I had coming up next, which was um, the skills and qualifications that you uh, have found to be critical in your line of work. And uh, the ones obviously that you would suggest uh, for us students to start developing. Um, I guess that sort of half answers that question there as well. So are there any more that sort of come to mind that you think are just really, really crucial in this line of work? Um, well, I think that that's, if you're going to go into, re into biological research, right, biological research, you, you really do need that um, or, or some experience in it. And, you know, I'm not saying a degree in it. I'm just saying that you've got that familiarity with it. Um, and one of the things... Um, that uh, I, I'll, I'll try to put it. I, I, the first 40 year, 20 years of my uh, career, about every four to five years, I'd had to train in a new field. It might be parasitology or meat science, image analysis, how to do ELISAs, how to do bioinformatics, you know. And I found it was actually quite exhausting, actually, to be honest. Um, as um, um, a lot of people tend to go through and they seem to 
so that you can go through and it's just a straight through and you know you get to the end and that's it mm. it, it isn't you've got to be really flexible in scientific research because your fields fields and the technologies change over time mm. and um, a lot of people that struggle with that they get get into a position where they don't feel comfortable you get what i mean they sort of say well i've trained for all this time and now i've got to train again or retrain and they don't feel comfortable with it mm. but you do life is a learning exercise yeah and as you said beforehand you know it's the straight arrow versus the winding path and yeah. uh you know life is very rarely a straight straight path so, yeah yeah, no, that's, yeah that's and um one thing is is i'm probably speaking against myself now as well um and there's a key issue looking at people like myself um because um we're we're, we're here after 40 years okay mm. and it's called survivorship bias you know um very few scientists last that long um mm. and we're probably not good examples to study on why i have survived you get what i mean um it'll be probably also profitable to talk to people that have left science to find out why they've uh, left science. You know, I might be just very lucky well, uh, uh, that I've been enjoyed the job that I've had and I've been, had a, I've been very happy with what I've done over my career. Yeah, but I, I do think that that is a, an issue here is, is, is that we tend to look at the examples that have um, lasted the distance as it were. Mm. Um, it probably would pay to look at some people that haven't as well. Yeah, well, I think as well, um, I mean, especially looking at the current situation after COVID, uh, a lot of people may be thinking about changing career paths if, for example, what they're currently working in is is no longer viable. Um, so having that ability, as you sort of said beforehand, to, to adapt and to actually look at another field. Yeah, I think that's, I think that that's, um, that's important. I, 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 I'm, I'm actually quite hopeful about COVID-19. I think that it is, um, I've got a, um, in, in the area that I've been in, right, if everybody's doing well and, um, um, the business, you know, farming essentially is doing well, mm -hmm. uh, in actual fact, um, People don't really like scientists at those times um, because science and research and that, by its nature, it's disruptive to business. Mm -hmm. You see, the, we are, the area that I work in is not so much in the universities and it's, it, it's sort of in the middle between the universities and, and the actual businesses. And so when we're doing research and stuff like that, generally what we come up with is disruptive people don't like change so you actually find that one of the times that uh people are very receptive to change is when when they're under challenge and and things like that and they're much more um accepting of you know research and science as a, as a discipline mm -hmm. and Let's... that might sound a bit strange to you but uh, and i I actually think that from a, a, a biological science basis, which is pretty much what your group deals with, mm. is I think it's actually a very good time in New Zealand for that, because I, I think that there's been more, much more of a focus that that's a pretty critical part of our economy. Mm. Well, that's certainly uplifting to hear. So yeah. do you think, yeah, so with regards to, to this whole coronavirus situation, uh, do you see particular opportunities um, arising from it all that you would suggest students to maybe consider looking into? Um, well, um, it really has thrown uh, back a lot of focus on that um, our um, biologically based exports are a very large part of our economy. They, they support our economy. And they are um, have have been or will be much less affected 
by um, by COVID-19 or pandemics than some other things. Mm. Um, I'm not saying that there isn't challenges. There's obviously challenges with uh, harvesting and labour supply and stuff like that. But you know, and part of that is is that's that's you know where researchers come along. You know, do you uh, retrain people for fruit picking or do you automate fruit picking or you know um, there's, there's you know the the um, automation and computer uh, and computerization is a huge area that I'm not involved in but I certainly look over there's a huge area there that's going to uh, go right through all the uh, biological industries over the next 10 or 20 years. Mm -hmm. um, I would guess at some stage um, some form of gene editing is going to become uh, more prevalent, um, but to get there, um, we really need to know a lot more about the genomes of all the enterprises that we deal with as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's a, a very good point as well that, I mean, as our technology is developing, uh, maybe there are just going to be opportunities there to get involved that are either mitigating the effects of coronavirus or working with it. Because as I understand it, uh, your research has been primarily with sheep genomics and genetics, is that correct, and breeding? Uh, yes, um, sheep genetics up till about uh, 20 years ago and um, sheep and cattle and deer um, genomics uh, uh, for about the next 15 years and just recently we were reasonably lucky in getting um, Endeavour funding where mm -hmm. the plant geneticists and the animal geneticists work together to, to create low-cost ways of doing genotyping um, and that was because pretty much all of New Zealand's biological industries are niche industries worldwide. Mm -hmm. Other than uh, dairy farming, basically, we, we deal with niche industries, kiwi fruit, green shell mussels, uh, Pacific salmon, um, even dairy goats, and she sheep is internationally is a pretty small industry. So we needed to find um, really cheap ways that we could take the information that is or technologies that have been developed in other species and apply them in those and that's that's pretty much what we've been doing and so i've been doing all sorts of weird things in the last while you know um uh dairy goats in norway um tilapia in mozambique breeding uh I do a little uh, help a little bit with pine trees um um yeah the uh, all sorts of all sorts of species yeah. um very yeah. multifaceted yeah, well it's it was it's a we've been developing a tech low cost technology or using a low cost technology that's got broad applications but mm -hmm. the truth is is that we got into it because it helps industries like the deer industry mm -hmm. That's awesome. So for students who are interested in this sort of thing, and we've definitely got a few of those at Kiasma, um, do you think that uh, given the current climate, it is going to be much more of a challenge for students to actually get a foot in the door to these sort of uh, organisations and industries um, and whether those opportunities have been sort of decreased? Um, well, I think, I think that's going to be... Uh, um, there's always going to be opportunities for uh, internships or summer studentships and um, um, PhDs and postdocs. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I would say that in actual fact over the last five to ten years there's probably been more opportunities from in the CRIs than there was previously. There's been quite a bit of pressure on the CRIs to do it and I think that um, it was a bit of an opportunity missed that they, uh, prior to that, that they were, were, they've always had those opportunities, but they were perhaps not as easily accessible. So I, I, I think that that's, they're going to be there. 
there might be a wee bit of a challenge in the very, very short term, but the government seems to be pretty keen, or the current government seems to be pretty keen on at least maintaining um, those opportunities in the short term. And I think from an industry point of view, um, um, I would be reasonably positive. Um, the um, uh, sort of advice is, these are people coming out from their undergraduate degrees. Um, we've had a reasonable number of people come out from our undergraduate degree and work as uh, research associates for one or two years and then go in to do their PhDs. And I think a lot of people find that useful. Um, how could I put it? Um, well, they get a fair feel for whether science is really a good um, career for them. They understand both the benefits and disadvantages um, by doing it that way, but it also, particularly if they learn some good lab skills, it's a great way to learn some good lab skills as well. Mm. Um, um, so so I, I wouldn't say that it's going to be vastly easy or vastly difficult. I, I think I think the opportunities will be there. Mm. That'd be my guess. That's good. So out of all of this, um, from your extensive experience, uh, looking back, is there one particular element of personal professional development that you would encourage our students to really consider developing and pursuing now? I think I've covered, you know, if you're in biological sciences, um, don't ignore the statistics and the writing skills and the computer programming part. Don't ignore those. They, you really do need them. Mm -hmm. um, I think one thing that tends to be a bit different um, in research institutes and in, in the wider community, I, I you know, there's a there's a lot of people that go through university and say get PhDs or masterates or that. They don't all turn turn out to be professors basically at university. You get what I mean? As a very large portion of them go out into industry or go into various occupations. And in actual fact, they some of them probably are much more successful in those occupations than the people that stay in the university system. But it seems to be increasingly nowadays, you're a part of a team. You've got to be a team worker. You've got to have the organizational skills and the approach to be able to work in a team. You get what I mean? And that, and that is probably, you know, when I said some people go and work as technicians for a wee while, that's probably the major thing that they actually learn actually is that they have to learn to work as part of a team. Nowadays in our group, you know, we have statisticians and bioinformaticians and we have people that uh, do phenotyping or technologies, different technologies, people that work in the lab, you know, uh, there's a whole lot of diverse skills there. Most people, uh, well, nobody can know all those skills, but most people only probably really have one or two of them. And so you've got to be able to work in a team. Yeah. And I think that's that's so true. It's so, so important. It sounds pretty it sounds pretty trivial, but <laughs> it is important. I think it's it's one of the things that actually is probably overlooked the most because people think, oh well, that's a given. And then it comes down to actually working as a team, it can often go quite sideways. Yeah. The most successful groups are teams that work well together. Yeah. Well, look, John, thank you so much for, for talking with us. I realize that I've stolen more of your time than I probably should have. Right. Uh, yeah, and I think a lot of students, especially those that are a bit worried that they're not sort of flying the, the straight and narrow path, um, it's really cool to hear that you can, you know, you can expand your skills, you can, you can try out a couple of different sort of organizations or experiences, um, but if you sort of keep learning and you keep driving forward um, as, as you have, I think that's, that's a really, really good way to look at it. Yeah, be flexible. Yeah. Go on. Thank you. Thank you so much.